We are continuing on Mem Gimel Ahmed uh, base. Where the Gemara uh, mentioned the, um, we're in the midst of, of, of uh, a question of Mukta. And uh, the question is in our mission, if the meaning of the mission is because uh, the reason why you can't put a vessel underneath um, dripping oil is because you may not be mavatel kli mehechano, you're not allowed to. Uh, it, in, uh, it remove the usage of a vessel uh, that's usable on Shabbos and make it unusable on Shabbos, whether it's because it, it then permanently makes it sit in its place and is sort of uh, building it, or it destroys the vessel by use, destroying the usability of the vessel for Shabbos, it sort of is breaking the vessel, or you're creating a muksa, which is a problem. Either way, that's uh, uh, the concept of uh, you're not allowed to uh, remove the usability of a vessel, or because or you're not allowed to take a vessel unless what you're taking it for is also allowed to be moved. But if I'm if the item I'm taking it for is a muktza, I'm not allowed to take a vessel. For instance, I cannot take a, uh, a pot and move it onto, uh, over a, uh, and put it over a, a, a egg, which was laid on Shabbos. If the egg is muksa, I can't take a pot for it. And essentially, the Gemara said, on account of that, Rav Huna said that if there's a deceased person in the field or in the yard, and you need to protect it from the sun, you can't just take uh, uh, something out to the, uh, to the yard and cover this deceased person because they are muksa. Rather, what you need to do is you need to uh, do it for a living person. So you go, you sit next to it, and it's hot, and so you, bro- you, you bring the, the uh, coverings, and it tells us how to do it in a way that it can remain there because it's an oil ara, you're creating essentially a temporary tent. And how to do that, you first bring the covering and then the sides. And, and as such, that's the way you will, re- you will construct the covering for... Uh, the deceased. However, the Gemara tells us that there are other opinions. The Gemara says, Itma was said, a deceased person that is, uh, is still in the sun. So Rabbi Yehuda, Omar Shmuel, Rabbi Yehuda says in the name of Shmuel, since the deceased person is Mukta, what you can do is that you can uh, move them indirectly. So this is Tiltul Min Hatzad, where when you take a deceased person or any mukta and you don't hold them directly, but you, you move them via something else, a tray, uh, uh, in this case, a bed, and you're going to move the mattress and uh, move the deceased with a mattress off to the second bed and to the third bed until that's how you bring them inside the house from one bed to the other. Rabbi Hanina Varshalamia Meshmed Rav Amar, however, Rav says, What you do is you put a non muktza item on the deceased, and they become the vehicle for the non muktza item. So you have a muktza and a non muktza, and the muktza be servicing the non muktza item, and so that you could bring them in. So Gemara says, Kula al Malad Pligi Dishari. Uh, that in this case, if you have a child that you can put uh, um, uh, on the deceased person and then this deceased person is going to be the vehicle for bringing the child in or a bread or any non muksa item, everybody agrees that's the optimum way of doing it. Keep pligi, the less late. But the, the, the Gemara is discussing what happens if you don't have one. That Rav is of the opinion that it, it, carrying it from this, uh, it, through something else, meaning that tiltum and outside, you're not holding the muk item directly, but rather you're holding something else, which is going to shift it into place. So that is, ca- still counts as moving it, and it's a transgression of muk so you can't do it. And one says, no, that's not a problem of tiltal, and you're allowed to move the muk that way. And therefore, he says, you can move them from one bed to the other. So let's say this is based on Machloikas Tanoim. So the Brysa says, if there's a fire, 
and there's a, 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 a pre, a, 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 someone who's already deceased in the house. And, and since there's a fire, you want to save the corpse so you, that you can bury it on Sunday and it's Shabbos. So what do you do? The first opinion in the Bryce says, Ein a like, you cannot take uh, the deceased person out. It's Moksa, and so you can't take him out. And Rabbi Yehuda Melakish says, no, you may. I, that's, I, I uh, heard, I received the teaching that you may. Hey, so says, what's the case? Again, if there is a non muksa item, uh, such as a loaf of bread, that you can take out and use the, the, this person as the deceased, uh, the deceased person as the vehicle to take this uh, out, so then you're allowed to do that. So my time the Tanakama, why would the first opinion say you can't do that? Idaleka, and if there is not, so then my time at why does Rehuda Velakish allow you to directly pick up the deceased and move them out? After all, it's a muksa. Elolab, but tiltum Wouldn't you say that this is proof that the basis of this machlokas is whether we say it's tiltul menatzad, moving something indirectly, whether that counts moving or not? And, the, and Rabbi Huda ben uh, Lakish allows it on account of that it's, that, that it's not a direct movement. So Gemara says, the Marasov or Tiltum and Atzad, Shmei Tiltum, Marasov or Lishmei Tiltum. Look, the Gemara says that's not the reason. The Kul Alamei Tiltum and Atzad, Shmei Tiltum. As Tazi points said, the halacha is that any movement of muksa indirectly, whether you do it backhanded or you do it through a different item that's going to um, uh, roll it off to something else, that's going to be a, a, a permissible form of moving muksa. Oh my, uh, uh, so then what's the reason that Ryuda Malakish, who, who disagrees and says you're directly allowed to remove the deceased from the fire and you don't have to do it indirectly. Since a, a person is concerned about the deceased, even though they're not alive, but, but that's going to be distressing to a person. If you don't allow them to remove the deceased from this uh, from uh, this fire, uh, they will they will extinguish the fire, um, and and as such, that's going to be a Torah pro uh, transgression. And so the Chachamim said, look, if there's a chance that this that our uh, enactment is going to cause a Torah transgression, of course, that's uh, worse. And so we're on the top of uh, forty. Uh, uh, 44a just one is like a the mace in this halacha that if there is a fire um which is not endangering anybody's life right obviously if there's a fire as we'll see later on in the Masech, if there's a fire that's endangering anybody's life of course uh you would extinguish the fire whether it's endangering people in this house or it can spread uh, other places in the city um, so, of course, that, that you would extinguish a fire. But the case is that there is not, it's not a danger to anyone else. And so, uh, uh, and you've taken out what you need uh, for Shabbos from the house, as we'll see uh, later on what the Allah is in regards to that. But there is a deceased person in the house, pre-deceased, and you want to make sure uh, that uh, they get a proper burial, so you want to remove them. So the first opinion says, since the deceased person is muksa. You can only move them in a way that's uh, permissible to move Moksa. Um, and uh, Rabbi Yudem and Lakish says, no, that in such a case, the Chachamim did not uh, 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 extend the enactment of Moksa to such a case, and you're allowed to directly pick up the deceased and move them out in order, um, uh, in order that someone not be uh, concerned and end up extinguishing the fire, which is a Torah approach. We so we so we. Uh, I was wondering, say for Torah, we could we could take a sifrei kodesh. We could take out, right? Well, we'll see that later. Exactly which uh, what what is allowed to be taken out of a fire. So, but I mean, why wouldn't why wouldn't we say that a, that 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 a person who learned Torah or whatever would be like a safe for Torah that we have to get him out of it? Why wouldn't uh, he have? The, why wouldn't yes, he have the same kedusha as a safe for Torah? Why would they? They they're, they're already we 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 their life. You're not saving a life. That's the, 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 the. It's only if you're saving a life, and you're not saving a life. I'm. I'm just. I was just thinking about the whole. The whole. You know that that the Shishi Malav Riboy have to come to the Leviah. 
So it's a, because... Uh, That's for the life. Yeah. In any case, the halacha is that indeed yeah. you, you can remove them. The Mishnah said that you may not, the oil dripping from the candle on Shabbos, um, and you put a vessel beneath it to save that oil, you're not allowed to benefit from that oil. Um, and, and as we said in the Mishnah, even according to Rabbi Shimon, who says that, there's, uh, that there is no muktzah in general, and a very limited interpretation of muktzah, nevertheless says, that you cannot benefit from this oil because it had been dedicated to the mitzvah um, that you um, that you dedicated it for, which is the candle lighting. The remaining oil that is in the cup that you used for your candle um, or, or, or uh, dripped into a bowl, usr, it's prohibited because you're benefiting from something that was prohibited at the beginning of Shabbos. Rabbi Shimon Matir, Rabbi Shimon permits it after the candle is no longer lit. So what remains after the candle's been lit, after the candle went out, then you're allowed to use it according to Rabbi Shimon and the Chacham and Mishra. So the Mishnah says, we're going to get into the next step of Muksa that we're going to see. And we're going to see three concepts of Muksa today um, uh, in, in this Mishnah or the Gemara thereafter. Uh, the, we have a concept of muktza machmas mius. Muktza machmas mius means it's muktza because it is disgusting. Anything that you wouldn't use uh, on Shabbos on account of that it is, uh, it, it, it's going to disgust people to use it, is going to be muktza. The case of our Mishnah is a pre-used uh, candle a holder. So it's, it's earthenware. And you lit uh, some some fats or oils in there um, with a wick, and now it, the the flavor of that and the burnt uh, uh, um, uh, smell and and the the uh, the ash and the and the smoke are all uh, in there. It's just unclean, and as it's an earthenware vessel, it's absorbed in there as well. Uh, no one's going to want to eat from it. No one's going to want to drink from it. And since it's Shabbos, you can't light a candle in it. So it's got no use. The only use it has is lighting candle. You can't do that either. So it's mius. It's disgusting. And that muktza, machmas mius, is going to be a muktza according to uh, one opinion. We have another concept of muktza that we'll see in muktza machmas isur. Something that at the beginning of Shabbos is prohibited to be moved on account of uh, some prohibition that's with it. So a lit candle. Uh, there's a iser at the beginning of Shabbos. I can't move it on account of that. If I move the candle, it'll change the 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 light, the fi- the flame. It'll either make it increase because I've tilted the oil towards it, or decrease if it if it's not getting enough oxygen or more oil is getting up uh, to the top of the wick. Either way, that will change uh, uh, the flame. And every time it, it increases, I've, ex- I've essentially uh, cre- it transgressed the Torah prohibition of lighting fire, and every time it diminishes, I've partially extinguished fire. So either way, I can't move it at the beginning of Shabbos. So it's muktza machmas iser. There was a prohibition at the beginning of Shabbos to move this candle, and even after the fire is out for the remainder of Shabbos, this will be usher uh, as muktza machmas iser, muktza on account of a prohibition. The third muktza we'll see is muktza. Uh, a, machmas, uh, a, a, a mitzvah, which is not that uh, uh, there's a uh, uh, prohibition right now, but it's that there's a dedication to a mitzvah at this particular point, and that's the during when the candle is still lit. So now it's gonna the, the candelabra and uh, 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 and the cup and the oil they're all gonna be mukta. You have the but the flame itself is muktza machmas mitzvah. There is a mitzvah there because I dedicated this to the mitzvah of candle of Shabbos candles, and then everything else is going to be a basis ledover uh, 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 aser. There's a, it's a, a, the basis. It is uh, the 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 stand and the support for that which is muktza. 
So we have three primary mutzahs that we, uh, that we just spoke about, and we'll see different opinions as to which one applies. And the, 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 the concept of that which is the stand, the support of the muksa, the muksa is sitting on something and, and it's meant to be there, that will be a basis of davar asr and is going to be muksa on account of what's uh, sitting on. So muksa machmas iser, is there enough gamina if the iser is mid rabbanan or mid No, uh, if there is a prohibition on something, uh, then then I can't then I, I can't move it at the beginning of Shabbos. If I can't move it at the beginning of Shabbos, it's going to be a, 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 a muksamach masisa. The fact that uh, that prohibition is the uh, oraisa biblical the uh, shouldn't make a difference. The point of the matter is that at the beginning of Shabbos, I've set it aside and not and, 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 and as not usable on account of that. I can't I I, I can't uh, move it midravon or the oraisa. So we see like this metaltal and ner chadash. You have a new candelabra. So their, their, their nair, which is basically the cup that the oil and wick would go into, is called the nair. And they would be earthenware, basically these flat bowls that had a, a, a wick coming out of it. Uh, you can move it on Shabbos and handle it on Shabbos if it's a new one. Avala Yashat. But you cannot use an old uh, uh, you cannot move an old one because an old one is already disgusting on account of that it, it, it's, it has no other usage anymore. No one's going to drink from it. No one's going to put food in it. It already has the smell and the look of, of, of uh, uh, a used candle and no one's going to use it. Rabbi Shimon says, no, you can, use, uh, you can move any candle. Uh, um, I mean, no, there's any candelabra on Shabbos. Besides for the one, a candle that is, is a light, it is still has a fire on it on Shabbos. So we have the first opinion, seemingly, it, you can't move it on account of that, it's disgusting. And uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't say anything about it having been used this Shabbos, just that if it's an old versus a new candle. And the second uh, opinion. Rabbi Shimon says, no, you can move any candelabra and any candle as long as it isn't lit. Uh, even if it was lit, but now it's not lit, that's going to be fine. And this is muksa on account of the mitzvah. While it's lit, you can't do it because of the mitzvah or because of the prohibition that exists at that moment. So the b'risa taught. Metaltal and erchadosh avalei yashad rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda is the first opinion in our Mishnah. It says that you can move a brand new uh, candelabra on account of it's never been used, but not an old one. And again, this is, uh, as we'll see, um, this is talking about an earthenware. Later, we'll talk about a metal one. Rabbi Meir, no, you can move any candle. Unless you lit it this Shabbos. So Rabbi Meir is the more lenient one here. And he says, no, you're allowed to move these candles because even though that they're, they're, and, and they're uh, disgusting, no one's going to want to drink from it. But it's still a, a, no, no use, uh, uh, no negative use, no prohibited use was uh, uh, in this on Shabbos, at the onset of Shabbos. So the onset of Shabbos, this was a vessel that had some use. Um, the fact that people are uncomfortable with using it, doesn't mean that it's not a, a proper vessel, it's still a valid vessel. And as such, at the beginning of Shabbos, it was not set aside as muktza, and I'm allowed to use it uh, for the rest of Shabbos. Un- unless I actually lit in it this Shabbos, which means that there was a prohibition of moving it at the beginning of Shabbos. So muktza machmas iser is going to apply, and um, it, for the rest of Shabbos, it'll be also. Rabbi Shimon, Omer, Rabbi Shimon says, Chutzman anera dolik b'Shabbos. Not that if it was lit, but if it's still lit, if it's still lit, I can't move it. Cuffs up, but once a, a, the fire is extinguished, mutter lataltala, I'm allowed to move it. So uh, the, the, the candle, I light it before Shabbos. These are my Shabbos candles. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, nevertheless, as soon as the candle uh, extinguishes, I'm allowed to move it according to Rabbi Shem. Avol kosika orva shashis, However, if it's a big bowl, a cup, uh, and, and a, a, a big lamp, I'm not allowed to move them. 
But Rabbi Lazar ben Rabbi Shimon, however, Rabbi Lazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon, takes it one step further than his father. And he says, Mistapik minanera kava, that not only are you allowed to move a, a, a nair, this candelabra, this, this cup that, that extinguished, but even if it's dying out, that the flame is on, it, it, it ebbing away, and there's a little bit of oil left, I'm allowed to take that oil and use it for my salad or for anything else. Uh, on, uh, even though that that's diminishing the flame further and, and essentially causing its early extinction, ex- extinguishing, nevertheless, you're allowed to move it because he says that once the, the candle is already dying, there's no prohibition of mechabe, of extinguishing the flame by removing the oil. This is already on its way out. And also you're allowed to benefit from the oil that's dripping out even during the, the, um, uh, the time that the candle's burning uh, 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 because there's no extinguishing in that case either. Like even if the candle is still somewhat alive. alive. He agrees to his father in one halacha and disagrees in another. He agrees with his father, the less lay muksa, that he says that there is no muksa. The Gemara uses this term a lot, and we talked about this earlier. It doesn't mean that there's no muksa at all, but there's a very limited and uh, a, a narrow interpretation of what, uh, what would apply as muksa. However, he disagrees with his father in one point. The ilav was of our kava in la kava. Look, his father says only if the fire is totally extinguished, then you're allowed to benefit from the oils, or 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 at least uh, from the you allow him use a candle. The iu of our afilav the lay kava, and he says no. Even if the fire is not extinguished, you're allowed to benefit from the oils. Avol kosika arav ashashes leizizim and Second part of the Bryson says, however, uh, these cups and bowls and, 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 uh, and lamps, those may not be moved for the remainder of Shabbos. Maishnahani. And what's the distinction? Why would these be that you're not, why would it be that you're not allowed to move these while you are allowed to move uh, 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 a candelabra, according to Rabbi Shem? Ama Ula, so Ula attempted to say that, you know what, this last line, is not according to Rabbi Shimon. This is according to first opinion, according to Rabbi Yehuda. Uh, Save for us, Rabbi Yehuda. The last line is according to Rabbi Yehuda, who said that you can't use a previously used, you can't move a previously used uh, candelabra. Says also large cups and bowls and 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 lamps may not be moved. Maskef la marzuta. So marzuta challenged that. If that's the case, what what does it mean? Oh, but however, you're al- you're not allowed to move these uh, lamps and, and cups. And Rabbi Yudha says you can't move any of them. So what's the aval? However, Elam Marzuta, rather Marzuta said, no, that's not the meaning. Of course, the, the Brisa, the last line in the Brisa is a continuation of Rabbi Shimon itself. And Lo'olam Rabbi Shimon, V'chika Shara Rabbi Shimon Mene Rizuta de Daite Labe, Aval Hani de Nefishilo. Rabbi Shimon only said this in regards to smaller lamps because you're thinking about using the oils. From the onset of Shabbos, prior to Shabbos, you think, uh, well, how long is this lamp going to last? Two, three, four hours, and then uh, it'll extinguish, and I'll be able to use whatever remaining oil is there, and I'll be able to use a candle as a cup or whatever it may be. And as such, from the beginning of Shabbos, you're intending to use it. And as Tosis explains, since candles of Shabbos are made to be benefited from, as opposed to, for instance, Hanukkah, where you're not allowed to benefit from the oil, and you're not allowed to benefit from the light. Shabbos candles are made to enhance the home, to, to beautify the home, to give light in the home. And so you may, from the start, you, you're, you're intending to benefit from the oil itself and from the light. And so therefore, you're thinking from the start, and when it goes out, I'm going to use the oil for salad or for whatever it may be. And as such, you're waiting from the beginning of Shabbos uh, with the intent that whatever remains, I'm going to use. Whereas in a large cup or a lamp, those could go on for, sorry, until the morning or even throughout the entire Shabbos because it, they have a, a, a large amount of oil in there, fuel in there. And as such, you don't think 
from the beginning of Shabbos when I light this lamp or this big cup, that, uh, that it's going to have uh, um, some use for me in the middle of Shabbos because you don't know if it's ever going if to, if it's ever going to be available on Shabbos, the, the candle could continue to burn through, through the night, maybe through the day. And so from the start of Shabbos, you've already set, set it aside and say, this is not going to be useful for me for the rest of Shabbos. And that's why there's a muktzah in that. So Rabbi Shimon is saying a muktzah, but in a very narrow idea. If I, from the beginning of Shabbos, put it aside and set it aside and say, this is not going to be usable for me in my mind, not verbally, but in my mind, I've thought, eh, I'm not going to be able to use any of this oil or this lamp. So then it's going to be muktzah. And that's why the large lamp and the large cups are going to be uh, um, uh, muktzah. However, in the smaller lamp, where I, from the beginning of Shabbos, I know this is at the, in a short while, this is going to be available for me for use. So you're thinking, okay, so let me just check and see when it's available. So it's constantly from the, from the onset of Shabbos, even though that at the beginning it was muktza, it was uh, not usable for me because I have been using it for the mitzvah. And nevertheless, is going to be usable at some point. And therefore, as soon as it becomes available, Rabbi Shuman says, I'm allowed to use it. So Gemara says, we have a contradiction. In our uh, uh, original statement, it said any remainder of the oil uh, and, and in, the, in the cup, in the candle, or in a bowl are going to be permissible. And then, uh, uh, and, and then in this rice, you say anything in a cup, bowl, or, or lamp is going to be uh, prohibited. Wait one second. Is a bowl... Uh, small, and as such, um, you, you think from the beginning of Shabbos that whatever remains in the bowl you're going to use, or is a bowl a large thing where, just like the large cups and the lamp, I think from the beginning of Shabbos I'm not going to be able to use it. Which one is it? Rabbi Shimon Matim, Hasam Karadumi the Ner, Hacha Karadumi the Kus. It depends in the context. When we're talking about a Ner, which is a small uh, candelabra cup, there, the bowl mentioned next to it is talking about something similar to that, a smaller size bowl, where I put a, a oil in and a wick. There too, I think from the beginning of Shabbos, I'll have some use during Shabbos. In the context of kos and, and, and uh, ashashis, which are talking about larger items, so there the bowl is also talking about something in that context, which is larger. So we have three halachas here. Uh, the Rabbi Yehuda says that there's a concept of muktzah machmas mius, a muktzah on account of something being disgusting, even if you didn't light this candle at all this Shabbos, but it had previously been lit, there is a muktzah, you cannot move it. Rabbi Meir says, no, that's not correct. Only if it was not, if it was used this Shabbos, then it's going to be muktzah on account of muktzah machmas iser. At the onset of Shabbos, it was prohibited to move this, and so for the rest of Shabbos, I can't move it. And Rabbi Shimon says, no, it's only during the mitzvah that there's going to be a, a muktzah because I set it aside for the mitzvah. And therefore, and since it's a small amount of oil, I'm waiting for it to extinguish so I can use the remainder or move it. And, and so from the onset of Shabbos, I had an intent to move it. Bar Rabbi Shimon agrees. However, if I have a larger type of lamp, which has uh, enough fuel to go through the night and, and Shabbos, then I never from the onset of Shabbos think about uh, uh, perhaps being able to move this or use it, and as such, uh, it, he agrees that would be What about a metal candle? He says, if it was lit on that Shabbos, the one who said it was prohibited before is going to be uh, lenient here, and the one who was lenient before is going to be uh, strict here. Now, it, it, uh, th that means like this. We saw Rabbi Meir was the more lenient before. But which muktzah did he say? He said the muktzah of something having been lit this Shabbos, since it was prohibited to move at the beginning of Shabbos, that remains prohibited for the rest of, the, uh, uh, the rest of Shabbos, that prohibition would apply here as well. So he was lenient earlier, and he will re but over here his prohibition, his stringency remains here. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda, who was lenient before on account of it being disgusting, that's only true in an earthenware vessel. But in a, in a metal vessel, that's not disgusting. You can clean it out. 
and and as such, he's going to be lenient and and say that uh, it's prohibited as maus um, uh, mos and this is not disgusting, so it doesn't apply. And therefore, even if it was lit at the beginning of Shabbos, at the uh, uh, it'll be permissible. Lamemra. So what you're telling me, the Gemara says. The Rabbi Yehuda Muktzah Masmias is late. Rabbi Yehuda follows the opinion that there is a concept of Muktzah on account of something being disgusting. Muktzah Machmas Isur Lesli, but he does not have the concept. He's, he disagrees with Rabbi Meir not only that there is a Muktzah on account of something being disgusting, but he will also say there is no Muktzah on account of something having been prohibited at the beginning of Shabbos from moving in the case of a candle because you're not allowed to move it because you may extinguish it. But Tanya, but that's not true. Rabbi Yehuda, I'm a kol aner shematachas matal to chutz maner shadlikah be b'shabbos. We have a brayse that explicitly says Rabbi Yehuda says it's prohibited to move any candles that uh, are metal um, if they were lit that shabbos. If they were not lit, you're allowed to move them because they're not disgusting. But if they were lit that shabbos, you're not allowed to move them. Eliyat ma'achet ner. So if rather, if Rabbi Zera said this statement, this is the way he said it. Amar Rabbi Zera pamot shadlikah be olav b'shabbos a metal candle that was used for Shabbos. Everybody says it's prohibited to, uh, to move on that Shabbos. However, if you didn't use it for this Shabbos, everybody says it's permissible on account of that I, um, it's not disgusting to use it. And so I could use it for something else. I keep on saying candelabra, but I want to uh, uh, make a distinction. When I say candelabra or candle cup, the, their candles were in a basic a small bowl, and they would um, uh, be able to move those. Those were very um, uh, transportable uh, items. But if you have a large candelabra that you set in one place, and it's always there, you don't really move it from there. Whether it's because it's heavy and it, and it, and it sits well and it looks nice there, or whether it's expensive and you don't want anybody to handle it, that's going to be another muksa that we're going to see um, that's, that'll apply to something else. Uh, and, and, and it may be muksa even if no, it has never been used or it isn't used in use the Shabbos, and maybe even Rabbi Shimon will agree. We'll see. Uh, the the muksa that I'm talking about here, that Gemara is talking about here, in a, say a candle or candelabra, these are small, very movable bowls or small candlesticks that don't have a set place and can be used for other things as well. Amar Rabbi Yehuda. Amar Rav. Rabbi Yehuda said in the name of Rav. Mita sheyech delamos. I have a cushion that I uh, set as uh, uh, my coin uh, cushion, my coin um, uh, place. This is where I'm putting, um, uh, it designated as where I put my money. Asilataltala. You're not allowed to move it, seemingly even if there's nothing, no muktza on it at this point. Uh, even though that there's nothing on it, I can't move it. So Rav Nachman Yitzchak, so Nachman Yitzchak challenged it. Metaltal in ner chadash, avaliyashem. I'm allowed to move a new candle, but not an old one. But the new one I've also designated already as something that I'm going to use for a muktza, like this cushion that I've designated for the coins. And for the coins, you tell me, that, uh, uh, that I can't move it on account of that it's been designated for a muktzah item. But in the candle, the designation of having set it aside as a candle, that's not a muktzah, only if I've already used it and it's disgusting, or if I use it that Shabbos and there's an iser, but it's not muktzah on, on its own. And now we turn to Mem Dalet on the base. Ma ner, de la avida. And a ner, a candle, meaning a candlestick or these candle cups, they're essentially, they were created, they were shaped and formed and made for a candle. And yet, and yet if I've never lit in there, it's permissible to use for other things. I can use it for a paperweight. I can use it uh, as an ornament. These, these bed cushions, these chair cushions that were not made for that. It's just a cushion made for, for sitting or, le- or leaning. And uh, I'm now designating it for coins. And you tell me just the designation is going to make it mozza? 
for sure, if the candle is permissible to use, this should be permissible, uh, permissible to use. Eliyit Malachi. Rather, if the statement was said by Rabbi Yudah in the name of Rav, this is the way it was said. Amar Rabbi Yudah Marav, Mita Sheyichta Lamois, if I had designated uh, 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 this cushion for coins, and indeed during the week sometime, I put some coins on it. I'm not allowed to move it, even if at this point there's no longer coins on it. It's already been used for its designated intended purpose. However, however, if I did not put coins on during the week, it's never actually been used for as uh, for coins. It's going to be permissible to uh, to move. Uh, however, uh, uh, if I did not actually designate it, so then it'll depend. If it has coins currently on it, I'm not allowed to move it because it, at the onset of Shabbos, they were a buses. They were the primary, they were the intentionally placed support for a muksa item. If they do not have coins on them, well, then it's not a bus. It's not designated as my, my coin uh, uh, space. And it also is not a bus. It's not the support, the basis of my muksa. And as such, I'm allowed to move it. As long as at the onset of Shabbos, at Bein Hashmoshes, at twilight before Shabbos, coming into Shabbos, there was nothing on it. So here we see this, this concept of Rabbi Yehuda, of Basis Lagavar Asa, where I intentionally place something on a, a, a muktza, uh, on an, a muktza on an item. That item now becomes the support for the muktza, and it takes on the status of that muktza for Shabbos. I cannot move it. Whether it's by designation and actual use during the week, so now the designation sticks. This is my muktza pouch. This is my uh, 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 um, muktza shelf, drawer, uh, 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 um, uh, bag cushion, whatever it may be, if it's designated for that and it has actually been used, or if at the onset of Shabbos, I took a muksa item and I put it there and I said, this is where it's going to be for Shabbos. Now that becomes a muksa item as well as a busis ledavar asa, the support of uh, uh, the, uh, the muksa item. So, so what is, so what is, so the, so the, so the, the question is whether the designation is permanent or not? Once, well, I mean, for, assuming once it's been used for the that, person. That, when he says it is a designation, that makes it a permanent designation as long as that's the, the usage, correct. Amar Ula. So Ula said, Masav Rabbi Laza, Rabbi Laza asked a question. There's, uh, we'll go with Rashi's interpretation of what this Muhani is. So they would have like a sedan, a uh, 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 box that was, uh, that was a seat uh, for for uh, people to be carried around it, and they could be carried either by shoulder, uh, and they would have sort of these rods that would uh, uh, be put into it to carry, it. or it could be uh, it could have wheels, uh, and that would also sometimes be pulled by a human or sometimes pulled by by an animal, and so these wheels can be uh, uh, put in and taken out. So muhanishala, the the wheels. If there are wheels that can be taken that that can be taken off and put back on, ain chiburla. It's not considered a connection and a part of the the sedan itself. The einim dedasima, and therefore it doesn't count as a part of its measure. The halacha is, and we've seen this a little earlier, that if a vessel is large enough that it, it that it fits. Um, uh, that it is a memsa, that it's basically essentially the size of a mikvah, uh, in a, in a 40 seya, and, it, and even the outer surface of it, it's the entirety, including the, 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 the shell of the box, would count for uh, that measure. And it's not mitalte malivareka, and, and it's not easy to carry it both when it's full, full or empty. It doesn't have the halacha of a vessel anymore. It's now a home, it's now a, 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 a something larger than a vessel and is not susceptible to tumor. The wheels, since they are re removable, will not count as a part of the measure in measuring this event. 
it also would not count as a barrier between uh, um, uh, um, the deceased uh, or the tent of the, the, the tent of the deceased and a muktza and a, and, a, and a tummy item or an item. So if I have this sedan and it's being carried through a graveyard, it's carried through a house that has the deceased in it. This this is in a self-contained space because it's no longer a vessel. It's it's a box that's large enough that it doesn't count as a vessel. To so anything in there or any person in there will not be tummy. What about these wheels? So if the wheels are attached, they too will be a part of the barrier. And if I had something sticking out from, uh, from the uh, box, the, the, the wheel would act as a barrier between the tuma that's below and what's above. However, if the, since the wheel is not a part of the sedan, it doesn't count as a part of the sedan, it comes off. So even if it's on, it will not be a barrier. And if something is sticking out from the box itself, that too would, con uh, would uh, be a uh, tummy. The ain gurnos of a Shabbos, bezman she'eshalamos. And also, if somebody put money on, the, uh, um, on these wheels or on the axle of the wheel, whatever it may be, any part of it that comes off of the sedan, that will remain muksa and you can't move it, you, you can't drag it on Shabbos because it is a busis, it is a foundation, it is the support of a davara asr. So Gemara says, uh, that's very nice. Ha, ain't allow mois shariat. That's, uh, it, it, that means it's only while the money's on it, it's permissible. Um, but if there's no longer money on it, it's going to be prohibited. That means that there's a muksa. That was uh, that had uh, uh, it was a buses of davar aser. This wheel, this axle, had was at the onset of Shabbos was supporting money. But once the money is off and fallen off, then I can actually move it on Shabbos. Afagav davar lebein hashmoshes. Amara says, "Ahi Rabbi Shimoni, the less le muksa." That again is the opinion of Rabbi Shimon, who does not have the concept of muksa, uh, uh, and therefore. Rabbi Shimon says, once the money has fallen off, there is uh, no muksa. And again, as I said earlier, when the Gemara says Rabbi Shimon doesn't have a concept of muksa, it does not mean he doesn't have any concept of muksa, because as we see here in this very statement, while the money is on the uh, muhani, I'm not allowed to move it, because money has no uses or usage on Shabbos. I'm not allowed to purchase anything on Shabbos. I can't use the money. And I don't want it to really get lost. So the designated place is it going to be it. And then he also says that it's a basis that it remains the support of the uh, of the muksa. And even though I'm only moving the muksa, if I move the muhani, I'm moving it sort of secondarily. It's going to be a muksa. Rabbi Shimon has muksa concepts, but in a limited way. And therefore, he's going to say as well that once the coins are fallen off of the muhani, it's not going to be muksa. And I'm allowed to pull this uh, uh, this sedan or these uh, wheels. Varav and Ravu said that you can't use this cushion on account of the money that was on it, either by designation during the week or at the onset of Shabbos. He follows the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda Svirle, he follows the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, as we'll see him. Uh, 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 and we're now on Mem Hayam and Aleph, uh, 50 and 45a uh, at the top. And it seems logical that Rav follows the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda in regards to Muksa, who is strict in Muksa. The Rav Kiryuda Sriyale, the Amar Rav, because Rav said, Even though you're not allowed to use an, a, a tree on Shabbos, why can't you use a tree on Shabbos? Because you may tear off a branch or tear off a, a, a leaf, and that would be a Torah prohibition. So you can't use um, a tree. You can't hang things on trees, you can't climb trees. And therefore, uh, uh, you shouldn't be able to put your, before Shabbos, you're camping somewhere, you need a place to put your Shabbos candles. So the, your, the tree branch looks like a great place and you want to put it there uh, for Shabbos. It, Rav says you're allowed to do that. Wait, but I'm not allowed to benefit from a tree. So he says, you're right. Um, yantif, I can't put it on. Now, what's the reason? Since he says that it's muksa anyhow, 
this candle is going to be muksa since at the beginning of Shabbos, you can't use it. The rest of Shabbos, it's going to be muksa. So I'm actually not going to use the tree because I'm not going to go retrieve the, the, the lamp from the branch that it's sitting on. And therefore, once I put the candle there before Shabbos and I light my Shabbos candles, it's going to remain there for the rest of Shabbos because I'm not going to move it. Whereas on Yantiv, I'm allowed to move a candlestick because there's no concern that I'm going to tilt it because on, on Yantiv, I'm actually allowed to uh, diminish and, 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 and expand the flame. And as such, I'm allowed to move the candlestick on, on Yantiv. So there, I can't use a tree because maybe I'm going to go to move the, the candle. Ahainu Dashani ben Yantiv of the Shabbos. And therefore, there's a, a, a distinction between Shabbos and Yantiv. But if he follows the opinion of Rabbi Shimon, where either way, once the candle is, is extinguished, I'm allowed to move the, the cup. Mali Shabbos, Mali Yantav. Either way, there's a concern I'm going to be uh, utilizing the tree on, on Shabbos. So from the fact that Rab made a distinction between Shabbos and Yantav, it says Shabbos, I can light my candle and put it on the tree before Shabbos because I'm going to leave it there. Yantav, where I can retrieve it, I may end up using the tree and I can't, and that's not a good place to put my candle. So we see Rav uh, follows the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. Tomorrow morning, Bez Hashem will challenge that idea. Does Rav follow Rabbi Yehuda's opinion of Muksa or not?